Hey everybody. So my name is Scott Dickinson, like Brandon said. I, uh, I'm here to talk to you guys about neck injury in sport. So you guys have already had some exposure to this in the winter session, it sounded like. So hopefully some of these injuries are uh, familiar to you guys and perhaps some will be novel. But either way, I do think that these will be injuries that you'll see in sport in the athletic training room. And so hopefully this lecture is helpful. We'll also have a lab component at the end of today, and we'll go through some cervical exercise, some cervical manual therapy, if that's okay with Brandon. And then uh, we'll look at the, uh, my invention, some, uh, some neck strengthening products. So with that, you're probably wondering who I am. So I went to Pitt for undergrad. I studied athletic training there. That was when it was still, uh, you could get the bachelor's degree. And so I graduated from Pitt in 2016. And after that, I went to USC for physical therapy school. So I went to sunny Los Angeles. I was sick of the cold Pittsburgh winters and enjoyed three years out there. And then I came back to this location at the University of Delaware. So I was across the street at, at Star Campus and uh, I treated several student athletes there uh, during my orthopedic residency for physical therapy. So I've stayed close with, with you guys in the university and I'm, I'm happy to be back. And this is me today. That's, uh, that's the next level that she's on there. So I treat part-time in the clinic about 20 hours a week in a physical therapy outpatient clinic. And then I work the rest of the time on my, my business around this device. So, how did I get here today with you guys? So do you guys recognize him? That's doc, Dr. Kaminsky, yeah. So he's on, uh, he's on the product. So we're doing some uh, research together. Uh, he's gonna be looking at neck strengthening and um, the, the UD uh, soccer athletes, seeing if this product strengthens the neck and you can see ob objective change. So we got that project rolling like six months ago and he thought it would be nice for me to come and, and speak with you guys too. So that's how I'm here. So what neck injuries have you guys seen in the athletic training room so far? Can anyone get, throw out a couple? None? Okay, so cervical radiculopathy, all right. Anything else? Thoracic outlet syndrome. Okay, good. We'll talk about both those today. What else? Sure, sure. And that's probably going to be your most common neck injury that you're seeing here. Anything else? That's good. That's a good list. So today we'll talk about stingers. Anybody seen a stinger? Worked with football. Yep. So that's a brachial plexus injury. Whiplash, probably most commonly seen in football as well. Have you guys heard of cervical facet joint syndromes or facet joint issues? Okay, so that'll be another one. And uh, cervical radiculopathy, like we said, TOS, and then one cervicogenic headaches. Is that familiar to you guys or is that new? Good, yeah, so we've got something new today. And then do you recognize that, uh, that neck? Can you tell by the jerseys? That's, uh, that's Peyton Manning. He had a, a posterior cervical fusion and uh, it's relevant to today. So how to categorize neck injuries? We can do so pretty simply. I'm a simple guy, I think in simple terms. And there's one question that I always start with when someone comes in with a neck injury. And that is, is the nerve involved? Right, so if, if you just start at the top and that's the question, is the nerve involved? Yes, then that, that leads you to several diagnoses. No, then that leads you to other diagnoses. It's a simple way to think about it, and it's how I like to categorize. So we'll start with no nerve involvement. So we already were, were suggested that occasionally there could be muscle strains or, or spasms that could be the cause of symptoms. What else could be a no nerve involved injury in the neck? bone injury, sure, and that could include vertebrae or joint issues. So that's a good way to frame it. So let's start to talk about joints. 
are you guys familiar with the cervical facet joints? Okay. So let's take, let's think about C3 vertebrae, for example. C3 is going to have two facet joints above it, two facet joints below it. So every facet, every vertebrae is surrounded by four joints. So they're very common throughout the cervical spine. There's 14 in that, in that seven vertebrae region. So there's a lot of them and they can become irritated. And this is the facet joint here. It doesn't look like much. It's just a plain gliding joint that slides on itself. So if everyone could just like stack your hands, this is the way that a facet joint slides. Say we go into flexion, the top vertebrae is just gonna slide on top of the inferior vertebrae. Side bend, say we're on the right side of the facet joint, left rotation is gonna slide it up, right rotation slides it down. Okay, so this is how facet joints move, just up and down. They're simple joints, they just slide back and forth. So let's do a little demo of how it would feel if the, the facet joints were restricted. So I'm just going to have everybody put their hands like this, a little V. You're going to come around and, and cup right at your hairline. And that V is pressed up against your hairline. Yeah. So now I want you to, and you're holding it nice and snug. I want you to see how much rotation you have left and right. Does anybody have full rotation? No, we're lacking. I'm, I'm thinking maybe 30 degrees here. All right, now come down to mid cervical spine, say C3 or C4, and do the same rotation. How much do we get? Do we get more or less? Okay, so maybe we're at maybe 45 degrees. And then the last one would go to the lower cervical spine and see how much you got. Okay, so what we're doing with this V is just restricting cervical facet joint motion. Okay, so it's an example of how it would feel if there's a restriction at a joint. So when you turn and motion stops, that is the facet joint being unable to move. And motion starts at the top, so C1 on C2, and then it works its way down. So as we went down with our V, more and more motion arised. Does that make sense? So that same thing would be felt, this kind of er, it just stops if there's a facet joint irritation where that joint just doesn't want to move, okay? Pretty creepy gif, isn't it? <laughs> okay, so facet joint syndrome, just think of it simply, an irritated joint, it's inflamed, it doesn't want to move. Causes, trauma, a whiplash injury, a blow to the neck. Sometimes you just wake up with a, a stiff neck. Anybody ever woken up with one of these where they can't turn? Does this make a little bit of sense now when you think about the facet joints and, and their lack of motion? Then the other cause is just unknown. Like I said, you, you wake up with it. Uh, so, well, I remember one time, I, I get these regularly. I was doing some overhead lifting at the gym and all of a sudden it felt like a little explosion in my neck and I just couldn't move. I was just completely stuck here and I was so embarrassed for like two days because I couldn't turn my neck and had to go like this to talk with people. So that was just a facet joint irritation. So it doesn't sound like much, but they can be very limiting. So the symptoms, obviously we're gonna have pain and it's gonna be unilateral, right? So the facet joints are on either side of the spinous processes that run down the middle, okay? So it's gonna be unilateral neck pain. And then there's a thing called referred pain. Have you guys heard of referred pain? So the location of the injury isn't necessarily the only place that the injury could be perceived. You can have the, the irritated C3, C4 facet joint, for example, but the athlete could say, yeah, I'm feeling it in my shoulder. And that can be misleading for the clinician like us, because we might think, oh, that's just upper trap tightness or soreness, right? But it could be the joint referring its symptoms down into the muscle region, the shoulder girdle region. So it's something to keep on your radar so you're not misled. Does that make sense? And then of course you are gonna have the decreased range of motion. Like I said, so you would see this person just being unable to turn past a certain point. That's the facet joints. Okay, 
So continuing on no nerve involvement, let's talk about joints plus muscles. And we're gonna be looking at whiplash. So you can see here, the man in red, his head flings forward and flings back as a result of the hit. And you can see that that, that, that puts this, the neck under a lot of stress. The neck is, is, is kind of a funny region. It obviously connects some very important real estate, the brain, the head, all the sensory organs, to this big, strong, heavy torso. And so the head weighs on average 12 to 14 pounds. And then these, this neck, which is a small area, there's not a lot of muscle, has a big job of stabilizing it, keeping it safe, preventing whiplash injuries, all of that sort of thing. So the neck muscles become very important. And so let's think about whiplash. So is someone ever gonna wake up with whiplash? No, right, you need a mechanism. So this is gonna be perhaps you guys see your athlete undergo whiplash mechanism on the field, or they would complain to you that their head flung around. They do usually have the word whiplash in their vocabulary, so they may even say it to you. So that helps a lot. Of course, we're gonna have some neck pain. And you know the neck's pretty simple. It can only uh, complain in a few ways. It can be painful and it can be stiff. So with whiplash, as opposed to the, the facet joint syndrome where it might be limited in rotation in one direction, whiplash is usually just everything is lit up. All the big muscles, the upper traps, the scalenes, the levator, all those guys are hypertonic and they're preventing motion in any direction, right? So this whiplash injury comes all the muscles tense up. They don't want anything to go wrong for the neck. They keep it really safe by preventing motion. So that's how a whiplash might present to you guys clinically. And of course, you could also get some headaches, which we will discuss later. Who's next? So now we're gonna look, think about the upper cervical spine. And this is a distinct region compared to the mid or the lower cervical spine. So occiput, so the top, or the very top of the cervical spine, the base of the skull, C1 and C2 makes up the upper cervical spine. Is this a familiar way to categorize the neck anatomy? Yeah, okay, so the upper cervical spine. It's made up of your atlas and your axis. What, what is the primary motion of C1 on C2? anatomy quiz. Do you guys know? Rotation. How much rotation relative to total rotation available in the cervical spine? Yeah, and what's normal total rotation? 80, 90 degrees. So if my math's correct, that is half of the available neck rotation comes from this one joint. So this is a, a very important joint. If this is stiff and the motion starts at the top, remember, it starts at this joint, C1 on C2. If this is stiff, the athlete's not gonna be able to move nearly at all, okay? So it's really important to remember, half of rotation in the neck comes from this one joint, and then two through seven make up the other 40, 45 degrees. So then the suboccipital muscles. Is this a familiar muscle group for you guys? So we've got the rectus capitis, major and minor, here and here, major, minor, and then obliquus capitis inferior, obliquus capitis superior. This is my, one of my favorite muscles in the body. It does all of that rotation we were just discussing between C1 and C2. So it is the most pure rotator in the cervical spine. It just pulls on C1 and makes the whole spine, the whole region spin. Okay, so that is the obliquus capitis inferior. And then there's, there's just two relevant nerves to think about in the upper cervical spine as well. And that would be the suboccipital nerve and the greater occipital nerve. Suboccipital nerve is going to come out of the suboccipital triangle, which is made up of obliquus capitis inferior major and obliquus capitis superior. And then coming out below obliquus capitis inferior is the greater occipital nerve. 
I mention these because they can be a pain source. The nerves and the muscles can be a pain source when we talk about headaches. So the cervicogenic headache, this sounded like it was potentially an unfamiliar injury to you guys. So a cervicogenic headache is defined as a unilateral headache, so it's usually just one-sided, characterized by non-throbbing pain, starts in the neck and spreads to the, uh, to the temple region, the oculofrontotemporal area, which is a mouthful. So the, the, the athlete will commonly tell you the, the diagnosis just by going like this. My headaches start here and they wrap around like this. They will literally trace it just as you see on this picture here. So a lot of times they just give you the answer right like that. Okay. So it can be misleading. They might say they have neck pain or they might just call here a headache. It depends on the person. Some people will say that this is neck pain. Some people will say this is the headache, but then they'll always say it wraps around the side of my head and it comes to behind my eye. So that would be the, 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 the thing to, to listen for. And again, this is coming from the suboccipital area. Those muscles could be the source, the greater occipital nerve, suboccipital nerve, all that could be the source. So symptoms, as we discussed, it'll start in the suboccipital area. Are these familiar? Does anyone have any of these? Anyone get any of these? Yeah. Can you describe it? Is it? Okay. Okay. So both sides could be causing the, the issue. So this is familiar. And does it happen when you're in bad posture, studying for a while, yeah. stressed out? Yeah, stressed yeah. yeah. So that's what you'll hear most commonly. So if you guys do end up working with student athletes, this might not be the injury that comes from on the field. This could be from the academic component. Um, I saw a soccer player over at the, at the star complex for this issue. Um, and she was a soccer player. It was just the result of studying and stress. Why would a chin tuck bother this person? Can someone think through that for me? Anybody else? My man in the corner's got, a, got it rolling. Anybody else? All right. Yeah, um, I would say it is, it is stretching out the suboccipital muscles. Those are primarily an extensor of the upper cervical spine. And then if you are going the opposite direction, the chin tuck, that could stretch out the suboccipital muscle group. And usually those are the irritated region and that could reproduce the headache. So yeah, it, it does involve the muscles with the chin tuck. Causes, as we said, uh, could be trauma. So this could result from a whiplash injury or some other trauma. And then most likely it's gonna be stress and poor posture. So treatment, have you guys done a, a suboccipital STM, a release in that region before? Okay, so that is familiar, excellent. So we, we'll go over that today if it would be helpful. So you can do soft tissue for the area. There's other manual therapy techniques we might do and then some specific exercises, most likely to strengthen the postural muscles that would prevent this person from falling into a bad position. So we would probably be treating areas outside of the, the suboccipital region specifically to help with this issue. So back to the big question, is the nerve involved? So now we're gonna say, yes, the nerve is involved and that opens up a couple diagnoses that we should think through. So the nerve roots, there's a nerve that exits between the intervertebral foramen of every single cervical vertebrae and they are numbered one through eight. You guys are familiar with this, I'm sure. This commonly is, is reported by the, the lay population as a pinched nerve. So sometimes patients will be able to describe this to you. They're not going to say cervical radiculopathy, but they might know that this is a, a pinched nerve. So the symptoms of this issue would be upper extremity pain. So have you guys seen this in the clinic or dealt with this yourselves? 
Is this something that's walked into the athletic training room before? So it's relatively uncommon in the younger athlete, but as you work past the collegiate level, perhaps the professional sports level, it will be seen. Um, I was consulting with one of my friends who's an athletic trainer on the Ravens, and he was telling me in his three years there, they have seen two cases of cervical radiculopathy. So he thought it would be good to, to bring in for you guys. Now, the symptoms are gonna be upper extremity pain. And I have a question for you. If this is the location of the injury, right at the nerve root as it exits the cervical spine, why would they be feeling arm pain? Any thoughts? Sure, so the nerve continues down into the arm. Yes, we're all familiar with that, right? So it's, it's gonna continue down into the arm. Uh, the location of the injury, similar to referred pain, this is called radiating pain. The location of the injury is not often, or it, it can be not the only place where pain is perceived. So the patient could come in with only arm pain. And that could be misleading, right? Because it doesn't necessarily suggest that it's coming from the neck automatically if you're not thinking about it, if you don't start with a broad differential diagnosis. So the neurologic signs, do you guys, have you guys done the upper quarter, lower quarter screens? What are those, uh, what are those tests made up of? There's, there's three categories. One would be myotomes, dermatomes, reflexes, very good. So we got upper extremity weakness. That's how a myotomal pattern would present. And it would be specific to one nerve root level, right? So it would be a myotomal pattern for one nerve root. We got sensory loss. That could present as change in sensation, like a paresthesia, tingling, that kind of thing. Or in a more severe case, it could be absence of sensation. So sensory loss, true numbness. That's relatively rare, but that is a, a serious condition. Then hyporeflexia. So hypo meaning under, that is below your normal two plus reflex. How would you guys know if this is abnormal for your athlete when you're testing, say, the right arm? You test bilaterally, right? So some people just have hyporeflexia. They'll just have a one plus standard. And so by being able to compare side to side, you're able to draw some conclusions that you wouldn't be able to otherwise. So to think, to think through, for example, a C7 nerve root radiculopathy, can, can someone kind of walk me through what you might expect? So C7, do you guys have this uh, accessible in your brains? What, uh, what muscles would be weak? Tricep, okay. So we would test the tricep. Perhaps they wouldn't be able to hold against resistance. Perhaps their arm would collapse in a very se severe scenario. And then we would have some sensory loss. What pattern would that show? It's on the slide, right? Yep. And then we would have hyporeflexia. Where do you test the C7 nerve root reflex? No problem, no problem. Where were we? So, uh, hyperreflex, so yeah, so C7, nerve root, where would we test that reflex? Triceps, yep. It's definitely my least favorite position to test. It's always awkward to either put their arm up here or to get behind their elbow in some way. Um, so I would definitely recommend practicing your reflex testing. Causes of cervical radiculopathy. It's often idiopathic. Um, in, my, in my clinical practice, which is usually with the lay person, our mom or our dad type of, uh, of patient, they usually walk in and it's from sleep. They woke up with it. Uh, they can't figure out what they did. Why did this happen to me? They don't know what's happening. They don't know what caused it. That's the most common. And then occasionally it can be trauma as well. So again, your whiplash, uh, hit to the head, anything like that. So the treatment, 
what is uh, what is the standard treatment if we have only our hands to, to help this person? What would we what would we think about doing if there's cervical radiculopathy? This may or may not be something you guys have covered, but we're going to go over it today. If not, like nasal amen. Yep, yep. Just traction. So you would just pull on the head. Super easy. So it looks something like that. We can go over that today if you guys like. Uh, there's a lot of positions you can do it in. And uh, usually that's pretty effective. I've had good results with that, and it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, you do other manual therapy techniques, and then uh, some exercise would be the, the physical therapy or the athletic training rehab program. And then if things don't go well, you would potentially have to refer them to surgery. So I, I was referencing my friend uh, it was with the NFL team. He had one, one guy who had cervical radiculopathy treated conservatively. The other guy was treated with uh, ACDF, so anterior cervical discectomy and fusion. So they would cut to the side of the throat and the trachea, the esophagus. They would cut here, get down to the level of the anterior vertebrae. They would remove the disc which likely has lost its uh, ability to create space between vertebrae, and that could be the, the source of the pinching on the nerve. So they open up the vertebrae, and they'll put some form of plug. Perhaps it would be a bone plug from the patient's own pelvis. It could be an artificial plug, uh, you know, a piece of plastic, or uh, a cage, a piece of metal. And then they'll tack down a plate in front of that new disc and the plate prevents the, the bone plug from coming back out. Okay, so, go ahead. Sorry, what was the second part of that? Yeah, yeah, both, both. It could be, it could be both idiopathic that you need to get this surgery or from a trauma. Um, so, the idea being now that uh, that that cervical unit, say C2 on C3, has a little bit more space between the vertebrae, and that allows the nerve root to exit without compression nearby. So what kind of motion are we expecting from that region after a fusion? Would that, would that level be able to move? Not at all, right? So we're not expecting any motion from that level anymore. So there's going to be some level of motion loss. And the unfortunate thing is the above joints and the below joints end up having to work much harder because they're trying to compensate for a now fused vertebrae. Uh, yes. So downstream, downstream from the nerve roots, which is at the, the most superior part or the most um, central part. And then the nerve roots will branch into the brachial plexus. Did you guys learn this for memorizing your brachial plexus? Real trainers drink cold beer. Is that how you guys remember it? No. So roots, trunks, divisions, cords, branches. That's what I got uh, at Pitt. So let's talk about thoracic outlet syndrome. So that was something that was mentioned as uh, something that's been seen in the athletic training room for you guys. So this will be good. We have three potential entrapment sites an entrapment site is where the nerve is, is trying to go smoothly down into the arm and there's something pressing on it, okay? So this is a nice review of anatomy because it, there's three entrapment sites possible for a thoracic outlet and for a neuro, neurogenic case. There's also a vascular thoracic outlet syndrome. It's less common. I didn't think it was relevant for today. So we'll just talk about the neurologic thoracic outlet. So there are three regions where the nerves can be compressed as they move towards the upper extremity. The first one would be the scalene triangle. So the nerve roots all exit between the anterior and the middle scalene, and it forms a little triangle. So if that triangle becomes more narrow, say the scalenes are hypertonic or irritated, maybe they had a whiplash injury and now they're hanging on for dear life, then that region can be a source of an entrapment for the nerves as they exit. So they could be getting pinched on and, and unhappy. Then of course, the pain will radiate distally 
from that location. The next lo location that could be a site of entrapment is the subclavicular space. So if everyone pushes down your clavicle into your rib cage, that would be uh, another potential reason that the nerves could be pinched. An, an offloading technique like this, where they just elevate their shoulder girdle slightly, would relieve that pressure immediately. Does that make sense anatomically? Third location, my favorite, is right behind the pec minor. So, and that is something that we can have a direct impact on in the clinic or in the training room. Uh, a lot of times the, the patient will have a forward scapular posture, perhaps rounded shoulders. Working on the pec minor just with our hands can be helpful for relieving this entrapment site. So three spots, two we can work on very easily with our hands. Have you guys heard of the Roos test or the East test? Have you guys done it before? Three minutes, I, arms open and close, hands open and close, see how fast you can do it. And that would, in theory, bring on the symptoms during that three minute test. So that's an example. Uh, the symptoms, pain, numbness, tingling, and it's usually going to be along the medial forearm and the medial two fingers, four and five. So that can be a little bit confusing. What, 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 what might we confuse TOS with? That's, yeah, that's a good thought, right? So ulnar nerve is going to travel that same distribution, so medial forearm into the medial fingers. So we have a peripheral nerve entrapment, an ulnar nerve issue, cubital tunnel syndrome, or what else? Maybe a little bit more upstream. A cervical referral? A cervical referral, like, yep, yep, a cervical radiculopathy. That could look a lot like TOS. Right, so say the patient's only symptoms are pain, numbness, and tingling along this distribution. That could very easily be cervical radic or TOS. So we have some tests to, to look at those, um, which we can go over today if it's helpful. Have you guys done spurlings and that distraction and, and ways to test for cervical radiculopathy? Okay, good. And then you have tests for TOS. So you would use those too to determine which is the source. Stingers. Have you, so you guys have seen this in the athletic training room, right? Brandon, do you guys see this at football? Oh, yeah. How often, how many per season, you think? Uh, minimum five, probably. Um, and now, are, are the majority of them pretty mild, go away in a day or so, or do they linger? Pretty mild, from what we've seen, yeah. Okay. That's good. So if you guys end up working with football, you will see these. Uh, this is the classic mechanism. It is a, a traction, say, of the, of the right brachial plexus. It's a traction injury where one end is being pulled from the other. Now, you guys have been in the cadaver lab, right? Do nerves stretch? Do they stretch well? No, it is, a, it is a taut string. Those do not move very well. So this kind of mechanism would just yank end from end and could cause a lot of irritation. So this scenario is a side bend with contralateral shoulder depression. That is the, the classic mechanism. The other two mechanisms would be a direct hit to the brachial plexus, for example, a, a helmet to the region, or a compression injury. So you know, in theory, uh, from this same mechanism, you could have the compression injury on the, op on the opposite side. Now the majority of stingers are a neuropraxia, which is you know, level one, grade one, the least serious of the stingers. And that's defined as traumatic, transient, which is why I asked Brandon, does it go away within a day or so? Neuropraxia of a cervical nerve root or brachial plexus. Okay, so the symptoms, of course you're gonna have pain right in the brachial plexus region no doubt about that, and then it's going to radiate down into the arm. Weakness and paresthesia of the involved upper extremity is going to be common as well. 
Now, that, do you guys think that would or would not follow the same kind of nerve root pattern like we described for C7, where it was very specific, the triceps would likely be weak, but other body or other muscles should be okay. Do you think it would follow that same pattern, a brachial plexus injury? Would it be a more widespread or general arm weakness or a specific weakness like the cervical radiculopathy? More general, right? That we're not really able to selectively injure a specific region of the brachial plexus when it's pulled from end to end, right? It's gonna be a generalized weakness in that involved arm. So grade one, as I mentioned, is the neuropraxia that is transient. Hopefully that is gone within a day or so. Grade two, we're actually gonna have some axon damage. So the communication pathway for the nerve is gonna be disrupted. There could be some myelin damage. That takes weeks to months for lack of pain, full motor and sensory function. And then the worst case scenario is neurotomesis, which is a transection of the nerve or complete nerve damage where you'll have a permanent issue on your hands. Okay, do we need a break? We're good? All right, keep going. So now we're going to get into the lab portion. We're moving right along. So I'll turn this bad boy off. So do you guys usually just clear off your desks and, okay, very good.